Afternoon, welcome to Radioactivity. I'm Rob Lorai. Every other Monday, we do the Sustainable Living Program with John Butts, and John is here with several guests. Hey, John, how are you? Oh, real good, Rob. Great to be back, and uh, thanks to those listener supporters uh, that pledged during our last uh, fund drive, especially those that pledged for the Sustainable Living Show. We really appreciate uh, what you guys do and appreciate this uh, Great station. Rob, anything new in sustainable living? It's, it, it's all new, John. I, I saw this great uh, article in the uh, St. Pete Times yesterday in the working section. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, Marcy was telling me about that. Yeah, but it was all the people that do recycling, uh, including a guy who recycles carpeting. Uh, these are all local recyclers, and there was a guy who will install uh, rain barrels uh, and cisterns, and just a great article. So. People should look it up in yesterday's St. Pete Times in the working section yeah, on the front page. I, I have to read that one. <laughs> okay, uh, today uh, one of our guests is Bill Young, and he's in the studio with us here. And Bill's with the Florida Solar Energy Center. B uh, welcome, Bill. Hello. How are you doing? Hello, oh, real, real good. Uh, well, Bill, maybe you were on this program maybe three or four months ago, but tell us what uh, the Florida Solar Energy Center is all about. <clears throat> Uh, Florida Solar Energy Center is a research center with the University of Central Florida. The state of Florida put its research centers with universities because it kind of goes together. And we were established in 1974 with the oil crisis to help renewable energies, mostly solar, hot water, and photovoltaics, uh, get accepted with education, testing, standards, and reliability, and so forth to help the Florida citizens. And that's what established us. And from there, we've grown to be a big uh, organization of 140 people that do all kinds of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. and, and what's your expertise there? I have two. I do solar and disasters and vehicle transportation, uh -huh. alternative fuel vehicle transportation is what I'm here about now. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I did get a chance to visit the center, what, about three weeks ago for your open house. Very interesting, and I recommend it to anybody. And you had a little car race there, a rally race. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we had what's called the Sunday Challenge. We created it in 91. Uh, we were looking for something with our open house. Uh, every year, like Earth Day, we had an open house to get people aware of our place. They could see the kind of things we do, get aware of our educational program and what we apply and, and have for them. And we had the idea, or I had the idea, of this idea of a car race or rally to educate people about what you can do with transportation rather than just solar cookers and PV and so forth. Let's deal with transportation uh, because I had an electric car of my own from 1988 I had and says, well, let's bring this into work. <laughs> and do something here and so we got this idea to to do the Sunday challenge because of that uh, our open house was on Sunday so I call it the Sunday challenge and it's transportation so it was a rally to get people with alternative fuel vehicles to get together like car shows to change ideas experiment to educate people make awareness and to test and, and, and develop cars and so from there it's grown to a pretty big operation. And you actually have more than just cars, too, in the, in the race. Well, we have some motorcycles and bicycles and all kinds of different transportation devices. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a segue into our next guest. And on the phone from California, we have Chelsea Sexton, and she's with Plug in America. Chelsea, is, are you there? I'm here. No, that, so pleased to have you on, and what a privilege. Uh, can you maybe tell us what Plug in America is all about? Well, Plug-in America is an advocacy organization that promotes the manufacture and use of plug-in cars, so both plug-in hybrids and pure electric vehicles. Uh, we organized out of a, a group of folks that did a lot of protesting and various activities to save electric vehicles that were built in the 1990s, and we spent the last couple of years doing campaigns. Um, the work of Plug-in America actually is, is largely featured in the movie Who Killed the Electric Car, and we have since sort of reorganized and spend most of our time now uh, working with policymakers to help develop good policy and teaching consumers what's possible and getting them to ask for it. And, and I do a little bit of work with automakers as well to help them understand the market potential, but also, you know, to build plug-in cars again. Mm -hmm. Well, Chelsea, we have given that video away for the last two pledge drives, right, Rob? Mm -hmm. And we've given That's away right. quite a few of those. But for those that that uh, haven't seen the movie or heard about the movie, could you maybe tell us a little bit the uh, the movie that you were a star in? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, sure. Um, basically, back in 1990, there was a law that was passed in California that said to the largest automakers, if you want to keep doing business in our state, you need to build cleaner cars. And so the largest six automakers, you know, the big three from Detroit, but also Nissan, Toyota, and Honda, started building electric vehicles. And they put them out mostly to comply with the law, but did not thinking they'd ever actually be popular. And it turned out that not only did every single one of them sell or lease, but there were waiting lists for more. And in answer to this, rather than building more cars, the automakers actually sued the state of California to get rid of this law and started taking back these vehicles and crushing them. And, you know, we tried so hard. I mean, I worked for GM at the time, and so, you know, there were those of us on the inside as well as the drivers on the outside that were absolutely mystified and could not figure out what was going on, could not get anyone to tell the story. And so we did what you do when you're in L.A. and you were frustrated and you can't get anyone to tell your story, and so we made our own movie about it. Mm -hmm. And Sony bought it, and it came out last year in the theaters, and it's now on DVD. And I just found out it's, I guess, the number three documentary for last year. So it's definitely still sort of, out there, it has its own little grassroots life, and uh, it's doing well. And in the wake of it, all these people have started asking for better cars and electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids and different things, and it's actually resulting a little bit in car programs. Mm -hmm. so, so you know Bill Young, right? The, I do. Uh, uh -huh. well, well, Bill, what is wrong with the, the cars we drive today? Uh, they use gasoline, they <laughs> <laughs> petroleum, uh, that thing that's magically forever there, but not really. Uh, somehow we dream that it is, but it's not. Uh, so I guess the pollution, the congestion uh, on the highways, and the oil, the energy crisis that it creates. Uh, I may want to say here that I lost my to uh, Toyota Rev4 electric they took from me and crushed it. So, were, were you living in California? No, here. They, they, but you were driving around here, and they took it back from you. Yes, because I, I don't lease, and they took my car back. Uh, I didn't see it crushed, but they asked me if I would crush it here, and I said, <laughs> no way, and I'm going to hide it, and they got really mad at me and then came and got it. How so, did they get it? What did they do? Well, they came with a big truck and semi and some big, ugly eyes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were bigger. Not that they were really nasty, but they were really nice about it. But they did take my car and says you can't have it. And at that time, uh, there was 15 uh, Toyota Rav4s in Florida. Well, what was it like driving it? Oh, I loved it. I love cars. The cars are great. They're quiet. They're smooth. Uh, Chelsea can tell you she drove the EV1. I drove that too, but that wasn't mine. But they're great cars. Well, and so how far how far did it go? How long? How often did you have to charge it? Tell us, uh, you know, what were the inner workings of the car? I got about anywhere from ninety five to one hundred and five miles per charge. I have a charging station in my house, and I had four others in different locations, so I could drive to Orlando, Daytona Beach, and so forth. So I talk other people into. I mooched some chargers and got other chargers in other people's houses. So they paid electricity to go in my car if I went and visit them. So it was cool that way. But, and how long did it take to charge up? Uh, it took about two hours. And what was the top speed? Uh, it was had a governor on it, so it wouldn't go over 80. Over 80? I always thought electric cars <laughs> were, were kind of maxed out at 50 or 60. No, I have other cars that will do 120. Mm -hmm. Chelsea, is that? Uh, tell, tell us more about that. I mean, was that pretty much you could get an electric car to go up to 80 miles an hour? Yeah, I mean, most of them would go 80 miles an hour, but even better, they got there really, really fast. I mean, a few of them really dispelled this myth of electric vehicles being like golf carts. I mean, I used to take uh, Vipers off the line in an EV1 and took a lot of pride <laughs> in doing it as often as possible. So, I mean, they are incredibly fun to drive in addition to being quiet and clean and all these other things we normally think of. And, Chelsea, we, here in Florida, we cannot go out for most of the year without running our air conditioners. At least most of us don't do that in the car. John, sure. you probably drive without your air conditioner. But, but, but could, I mean, could, did, was the air conditioning on the car? Did it work well? How, how was that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they had all the creature comforts you think of in a car. I mean, they had cruise control and power windows and locks and air conditioning and all of those sorts of things. And it did work very well. In fact, a number of them had... Uh, the EV1 had the first automotive application of a heat pump. Uh, there was a lot of really cool technologies that were pioneered on these vehicles that we're now seeing in regular gas cars today. But, no, they were just like driving a regular car from the functionality standpoint. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Why, um, you know, from your standpoint, did, did this take place? Why did they crush these wonderful cars? Well, I mean, it's definitely a complicated story and, and the reason it became an, an actual, you know, 90-minute movie. But in short, the vehicles were their own best advertisement. The more they were on the road, the more people wanted them. And if you're a car company that does